That's a, a fitting pre-roll for our next guest. Okay, everybody, welcome back. That was a great talk from Jessica, right? Um, just a reminder, you know, I said it this morning, I really meant it. Like, you know, if this is your first FITC, or even if it's not, you know, you get more out of this the more you put into it. And I really believe, I've been coming since 2005, and it's been a touchstone in my life. Online events, you know, all these in-person events are great, obviously. So just check out FITC.ca any time of the year. There's always something going on. I highly recommend staying involved however you can. Um, okay, with that, our next presenter, Emily Maya, is a creative coder based right here in Toronto. She works for Jam3, you've probably heard of them, as a, crea yeah, as a creative technical architect on real-time 3D experiences using WebGL and Unity 3D. Her passion for video games and storytelling have led her to work on a variety of award-winning projects, including Oculus Medal of Honor Above and Beyond and East of the Rockies. Let's hear it for Amelie Maya. Have fun. Hey, guys. Uh, thank you for coming to see my talk. Um, yeah, I've been in Toronto for five years now. Uh, Jam Free brought me here, and I still love it. So let's talk about basketball and technology. So yeah, I'm a creative technical architect. Um, I work with TDs and uh, creative directors, and I help guide them through creating very rich, interactive uh, experiences using game engines, WebGL, like very cool 3D technology. Um, aside from that, I love to make generative art. This is kind of what's really got me to this place in my career. Um, I love playing video games. I recently finished Elden Ring. It took me a year to complete. It's very hard, but very cool. <laughs> uh, and I love raving. Like, raving's been a huge part of my life, um, and it always will be. It's super cool to explore the world and listen to your favorite music. Um, so yeah, let's get into this. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the term metaverse. Uh, but maybe not so much a microverse. Uh, microverses, to me, are like small video game experiences. They s kind of focus on an avatar. And a lot of agencies have been building their own kind of microverse solutions in WebGL. And we've seen Dreamwave uh, by Active Theory. And we've seen other kind of like um, kind of crowd-sourced kind of like platforms like OnCyber and Sojourn that rely on creators to kind of produce the content. So it's a very interesting field because WebGL and web technology is free. It's open source. And it's cool to see these kind of video game experiences come to life. But yeah, like, um, let's talk about fandom. Uh, fandom is very interesting. I think over the last few years, we've seen a lot of people kind of gather together to share their experiences and to talk to each other and you know share their passions for a lot of different things, like and basketball, you know, basketball kind of brings a lot of different industries together. It brings across gaming, technology, fashion, culture, and this is something we really wanted to kind of tap into. Um, audiences nowadays kind of like to um, experience things real time on their devices as watching games, you know, like people like to bet, people like to engage in stats and stuff. So sports is really kind of the frontier of a lot of new tech experiences, which is kind of cool. And fans also like to make content as well. You know, they love to remix things. They love to kind of put their own persona into kind of like, um, you know, highlights and stuff. So it's really kind of cool to see the user-generated content kind of coming out of fandom as well. Um, so yeah, like Pixel Arena, this was um, a project we did with MBA and Google last year. So the first version of this was to create a, a web experience for the MBA app. And this was kind of launched during the NBA playoffs. And very simple experience, uh, but a lot of rich content, which is kind of nice. You'll create your own avatar. You could uh, watch real-time highlights during the halftime shows. And you could also test your um, skills. Um, and a lot of the data was kind of fed through the real-time NBA API. So we were able to generate all these questions kind of on the fly to really test your knowledge and you know, historical MBA knowledge and stuff. So it's a very um, kind of simple experience, but really nice to kind of see fans engage in you know, MBA culture. But yeah, this kind of led us to um, thinking, how could we evolve this? How could we turn this into a microverse? And you know, MBA and Google really liked this kind of like first iteration, but they're like, we want to create like a Disneyland. And you know, you probably hear this all the time, it's like they want like, 
the fortnight of like web, microverse kind of technology, and we're like, yeah, we, we can probably do something like that. So um, we kind of spent a few months exploring this, and we were like, you know, let's create like a kind of a digital microverse, like a 360 degree kind of explorable world, and let's create more opportunities to tell story to the fans and stuff through, you know, Google technology, through like MBA culture. And this is kind of what it led us to. So this is a short summary of the experience we made. Crossover into the Pixel Arena. Take this dunk to the next level. Reimagine weekly NBA action. Make it your own with the Highlight Remixer. Share your creation and get your fit right before hitting the courts. Flex your skills with fans around the world to earn points and earn exclusives. Pass magic. Pixel Arena is now open. Enter through the NBA app. So yeah, pretty cool, right? <laughs> um, yeah, there's obviously a lot going on there, so I'm gonna, gonna go through all the kind of features within it. So we have Center Court. This is kind of the world you begin in. Uh, this is where you kind of connect with other fans. Uh, you can shoot baskets, you can block people. Um, you'll see a lot of dynamic content in the space, and it's Essentially, you know, like the main hub of the experience. Uh, we have the locker room. This is where you create your own avatar. You can customize it. You can unlock new content and equip it. And you know, it's your space within this world. It's always nice to have like a kind of like personal space as well. Uh, we have your pixel. Uh, this is kind of your command center. Um, if you play GTA, you know, you've got your mobile phone, your whip it out, and you know, navigate through different things, join lobbies, chat to people. So. You know, it's nice to kind of incorporate like Google technology as well into the experience. And for us, this made complete sense to you uh, this way. And then, yeah, we have a creator zone. Like the creator zone is all about remixing highlights. Uh, NBA obviously generate video footage every single week, every single day. So we have a ton of NBA history. You know, we can actually use. Um, um, what's really cool nowadays is that you can extract motion cap data from video. And we thought that'd be really nice, you know, what if your avatar could recreate some of the best moments from NBA history? So this was kind of the idea behind the creator zone, which is nice. Uh, we have the skill zone. This is probably the most complex zone. Uh, this is multiplayer games. And we released two game modes, uh, which is kind of like battle royale type experiences. Uh, here you compete with like eight other people real time. And yeah, you're kind of you put your skills to the test, and you know we have trivia, which is kind of built upon the first version. But then we have shot clock as well, which is a kind of combination of power ups and your agility to navigate around a space and shoot as many baskets as possible. Uh, and last but not least, we have the drop zone. So you know we need a place for users to unlock more content to kind of progress their career throughout this experience. So yeah, the drop zone is where you kind of connect with more brands. And you, you know, obviously, you want to like, unlock more content as uh, you engage more with this uh, app and stuff. So yeah, like traditionally, I would look at a project like this thinking, yeah, that's probably six to eight months. You know, That's a lot of stuff to do. Uh, but MBA were like, we want to launch this for February. And we want to do it in like three months. And a lot of us are like, yeah, that's kind of a lot to do. And for us, we're like, we're doing things for the first time, especially it's like technically a video game and like a live service product. So the only thing we could do is really scale our team up, you know? Like usually when we do these kinds of uh, WebGL experiences, we have like maybe three creative developers and you know a few front-end developers, but that wasn't really gonna cut it. We just needed to kind of scale up and try and figure it out. So it was kind of the craziest project to um, kind of like organize, but yeah, these were the kind of requirements. You know, we're not gonna say no, because this is something we've been wanting to do for a long time. And again, this had to be run within the MBA application. So we did have that limitation of we 
probably can't do you know the most real time like ray trace looking visuals, but we'll do our best, you know. And that's all that matters. But yeah, I was kind of stressed out 12 weeks. I was in every client call and they were like, what if we did this? What if we did that? You know, what if we added this in? And I'm like, oh my God. Like, it's just so much. And in the end, I was like, you know what? Like, the TDs are going to take care of the client. I'm going to focus on the team I'm leading. You know, like, we have to be super organized with our time. Um, I didn't want the clients, like, brainstorming to affect the work we had to do. So I was kind of stressed, you know? I, was, I don't usually get stressed in many projects, but this really was hard for me to kind of manage and like, you know, kind of plan out because we're dealing with a lot of new things for the first time. Like we've never done a multiplayer video game. These are very complex technologies we need to piece together, but with planning, you know, we can always figure it out. So these were kind of some of the technical challenges we had to face. We had to build an avatar customizer. Uh, we needed to make multiplayer games. We needed to create dynamic user-generated content. We need to design and build a world. Uh, we had to optimize it so it could run on Google and you know iPhones, and uh, we also had like you know a lot of game server related stuff that we've never had to do before. We had to you know add anti cheat game logic and connect all these people together and make sure it's real time and smooth and stuff. So there's a lot of complex things, right? But I don't have a year to explain to you all of those things, so I'm just going to focus on four key areas, which I think were the main kind of takeaway points of this, is how we kind of create the framework to make something this size, how we design the avatars, how we built the world, to optimize it, and you know, the kind of gameplay behind this experience. Um, so, you know, when you'd think about making a video game, you would maybe like, yeah, it makes sense to build it in a game engine because they deal with a lot of things out of the box, and you don't have to really touch those things. Uh, but you know, we're experts in web technology. Um, I've been using FreeJS for about eight years now, and it's been like 8% of my career, I think. I've always done a lot of creative coding projects using FreeJS, and it's what I feel comfortable with. And plus, a lot of my team are good with it as well. So we're going to stick to our strengths. And you know, we know we have to work within a web view, within the MBA app. So we were like, this makes sense. Maybe it's not going to be the most realistic like rendered game, but it's what we can achieve you know, with that time period. So when we start a creative coding kind of like FreeJS application, we have like kind of like um, a boilerplate to begin with, and that kind of means that we have a way of doing things. We have a code base that can be reused for a lot of different types of projects. Uh, you know, at the box, it handles asset loading, post-processing, uh, handling like you know multi scenes and lots of good performance and utilities and stuff, but it doesn't give us the kind of game engine interface that you know Unity or Unreal would give us. Um, so managing a scene or materials is quite quite difficult. We rely on GUI controls for that, and you know we always run into the same challenges. Like we always struggle with separating like logic and data from 3D objects. Uh, things can easily get hard to debug because code is scattered everywhere. And creative developers, we always do things differently. Um, we, it's a very unique role where you're not particularly taught it. It's something you kind of learn in your own time. And it's a blend of art and maths and you, you know, your passion for real-time 3D stuff. So a lot of the people I've worked with in my career like, always like to do things differently. So I'm trying you know, to kind of give them a framework and a structure to work to to speed things up and make things easier for everyone. But yeah, as I was saying, you know, we needed a better approach, uh, you know, tackling this kind of size of a project. Um, I needed to think of like a pattern and a structure for them to follow and also give them the best kind of tools uh, to debug their code as well. So I did a ton of research. Um, usually when I start a project, I spend like weeks just researching like what is the best way to do it. Uh, do we need to rethink a lot of things? And um, in video game development, uh, ECS, Entity Component Systems, use quite a lot. And this is a different way to kind of architect a video game. It really gets you to think about how do I you know, create the logic, create the data, and then tie those into objects within the world. And, it was kind of complex to get my head around at first, but 
I, I watched a few videos like um, Overwatch. They did all their gameplay and netcode in ECS, and I watched some Unity videos and how they did it, and they built this world with like 2 million polygons per frame. So I was like, seems like a good approach. This is something I want to kind of look into and stuff. And yeah, it kind of made a lot of sense. You know, I did a few prototypes. Uh, what I like about this, it's very simple. Um, I used a library, uh, but it was one JavaScript file. And usually when you're dealing with frameworks or libraries, it can be very you know, complex. And it just made a lot of sense to me where you would have a world with 3D objects, and you would attach behavior with components. Like this is very kind of similar to Unity where you would have a game object and you would apply a component and then you would have like maybe logic to kind of modify that data. So it was very simple for me to follow. And it's like, we have a lot of content in this application. So let's kind of use this and see where we get to. But over time, it really did make sense. I feel like, you know, we treated it more like a Unity 3D kind of game object. Uh, it was very easy to debug and maintain code. And it helped keep everything organized. I'm quite OCD. I like things to be clean. I don't like you know, spending hours to find some line of code that's going to cause me a problem. But for my team, I was leading six other creative developers. And it was very hard for them to get onboarded with it. You know? like, um, it took them a bit of time. It took them time to adjust. But in the end, it, it really kind of simple for them to use. So it's just something to consider you know, when you're using something new for the first time on a project. It's like how easy it is for everyone to kind of like get onboarded with. But yeah, it kind of worked out. Like um, we were able to separate things really nicely. Um, it was very easy to, you know, like find certain pieces of logic, you know, like we had like an avatar uh, state machine for all the animation. Uh, we had a, a system for all the basketball throws. So it's very easy to find stuff. And, you know, when you're working in a tight timeline, um, finding your way around code is like really nice, you know. We don't want to stress anyone out in that sense. So, but yeah, probably the biggest part of this project is avatars. It's essentially you in this universe, so it needs to be very cool, very represent representative, and you know, it's like it's it's kind of like who you want to be, you know. Like you don't have to be yourself. You can, you know, kind of like create this kind of fantastical avatar. Uh, we did a project with Adidas called Oswald, and this was our first kind of glimpse into avatars for the metaverse. Um, it was pretty cool because we partnered with Ready Play Me, and they're like a platform that generates avatars for different metaverse platforms. Uh, on this one, what was unique about it is that we would generate avatars based on your personality. And at that, after that point, you couldn't customize it, so it was kind of a one-off um, experience. But then people could take these um, avatars and import them into any metaverse through the Ready Play Me platform. So it was really cool because, you know, we were trying to understand, you know, like how do people like to represent themselves? Like what kind of fashion do they like? And um, our team did an amazing job on the fashion. You know, super cool. So um, yeah, like with this project though, we. We wanted to ask the client, you know, what kind of style do you want these avatars to be? Do you want them to be realistic? Or do you want it to be more fantastical? And it's very difficult when you make a video game, you know, because you want to represent yourself. Um, but you also don't want to tie into, you know, like real life norms. You know, we want it to be super arty and cool and stylistic. So um, we kind of went with, like, I'd say a hybrid approach. It's like, borderlines realism, but there's very fantastical elements through the clothing, uh, through, you know, the kind of like customization options you can do. And, you know, we all want to feel unique and represented in this space. We don't want to look like NPCs or just, you know, um, clones of one another. So, you know, Google kind of came to us and saying, you know, we need to represent diversity. And we also think, you know, we have 12 weeks to make this, and we can't make a million different customization options. So how would we do something like that uh, in a realistic production environment? Um, our idea was to kind of simplify this. So by having one body shape, but representing gender through facial features and clothing, we could kind of give people the tools to mix and match. You know, so it's up to them how they want to express themselves. but. The clothing and the facial customization options would, you know, give people those tools to represent themselves like freely. 
And, you know, this kind of worked out. Like, um, I think if you played a lot of different types of video games, you'll have, like, blend shapes. And you can just, like, you know, do a slider, and it's going to change the chin shape, the eyes, the nose, whatever. And this gave us the kind of, like, toolbox to give people that flexibility in designing their um, avatars and stuff. So it was kind of hard to get right, and um, it took us some time. But I think the cool thing is, is that, you know, we create so many different variations of clothing. We use a rarity system, you know, to make, um, make the clothing more desirable as you progress with the system and stuff. So uh, we use the kind of MBA Topshop uh, rarity labels, and that way, you know, it's always nice to give people kind of something to achieve and aim for as they keep playing. Uh, but as you can imagine, it took us a long time to get this right. Um, our first avatar tests were pretty bad. Uh, but sharing memes with each other was kind of a nice way to kind of like, you know, get through the stress, you know, the kind of um, the difficult parts of the project. So we'd always be sending each other funny videos every day. Like, look how cool this is, even though it's completely broken, you know? So, um, but yeah, as I was saying, like, this was a multiplayer experience. So how can we have like 10, 20 avatars real time in this world? Um, luckily enough, we were able to take a lot of learnings from Ready Play Me. And in the end, we just generated single uh, GLB files. They're basically 3D asset files that are compressed for the web. And uh, we packed um, textures into sprite sheets or texture atlases. And that way, you know, we could reduce the amount of like avatar combinations there was and really optimize these files. So if someone connected to your world, you just download a single asset rather than try and res um, replicate all their like setup and stuff because that could lead to a lot more asset loading. So it's very cool. And all the animations were applied um, after load as well. So the file was very small. It was only about 4 megabyte and about 8 megabyte of RAM. So yeah, it was pretty optimized in the end. Uh, but yeah, this was um, the final avatar kind of like um, generator at Google, I think three weeks before the deadline, saying, oh, hey, we want to add our pixel to the avatar's arm. And we're like, yeah, it's probably going to break a lot of stuff at this point. But you know, we always want to kind of accommodate client uh, requests. So. It wasn't so bad, but it, you know, all these avatars were generated server-side, so it was a bit tricky to kind of get everything working together, but it's kind of cool, you know, it's nice to show Google technology in this sense. And we also had like a randomized feature, so you can just like generate random avatars very easily. But yeah, so we have, uh, we have the framework, we have the avatars, but what about the world? Uh, the world's very rich, uh, again, this needed a lot of content and a lot of dynamism within it. Uh, we would have like dynamic trends uh, from, Google, uh, from Google. We would have interactive elements like jump pads, heaps, uh, portals, and avatars and NPCs. So there is a lot of moving stuff in this world. But there's also a lot of static stuff, you know, which could easily be more optimized. But it's just a lot of things to design and consider as well. Um, you know, with world building, we always start off with concept art. Um, we did use AI in the process, but it was more to um, help us with more of the fantastical elements. I still think human creativity is very important when you kind of come and, and approach a project like this. Uh, we did a lot of sketches. Uh, we kind of mapped out every type of asset we needed. And yeah, like we didn't have the luxury of doing like really polished concept art, but it gave the 3D artist team enough of a vision to kind of, you know, move forward with, which is kind of nice. But yeah, I think it's quite important to point out that all the decisions we make at the start will kind of affect scope, uh, workflow, and the delivery of the project. So having alignment between all teams, uh, creators and developers, is a really you know, important thing, because it helps define like, how we approach this from a technical standpoint and how we make assets. Like Assets are very um, technical-based as well, right? So we need our teams to really work together on this. Um, art direction is really important, and I always ask the designers, you know, what is the art direction? What is the vision you kind of want to go for? And they were like, oh, we want these like unreal looking scenes. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> sure. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's kind of cool to have, um, you know, like a North Star to kind of work towards. And I always like doing like the nice looking visuals, but 
you know, we kind of need to know technically what we're trying to achieve as well, right? So they wanted this very dreamy, kind of Disneyland, kind of colored like world. Um, it was enough for my team to go on. Um, but yeah, like, let's kind of see how we got there. Um, first of all, asset planning. Um, super important, requires a lot of um, technical consideration uh, to define the poly counts. Um, I think with a lot of FreeJS projects, people are like, what's the poly limit? What's the te texture limit? And you know, there's a million mobile phones out there, so it's very hard to define those limits at first, but going on previous projects, usually we recommend like, you know, a million polygons max per scene, and then let's say you know, we have like 100-ish textures, and we will run some tests. We will see like, how much devices can you know, like load and process. But in the end, you know, you're thinking about a lot of different things being pieced together. You've got the front ends, like the React application running on top. You have all these extra services and kind of technologies working together. So trying to plan assets is kind of a difficult thing. But you would kind of say, OK, if this is the limit of the device, maybe the asset should take about you know, 20 25% of the power that the device can have. Um, but it's important to you know, define what is the types of textures we need. Do we need normal maps? Do we need immersive maps? You know, what type of um, you know, lighting we're going to use? And that kind of comes from the art direction. And how many times can we reuse these assets throughout the world? Um, as I was saying, you know, like we should kind of define the limits for the polygon and textures. So when uh, designers kind of piece together these worlds, they have a, a sense of like how far they can push it. And most importantly, having someone to oversee this process, we had a lot of producers. And we had a producer per department. And I think that really helped. We had a motion uh, producer that kind of just managed assets. And as you can imagine, we had hundreds of assets. And knowing when things are going to be delivered and when we can integrate is really, you know, really important because it helps out both teams. So technical art, this is kind of how we approach the visuals from a technical direction. Uh, given the sense this was a very short timeline, we opted to do things real time. Um, real time is kind of, you know, it's not going to look the best, but it's going to be the fastest and most performant in a sense. That, you know, we can tweet lights, we can tweet shadows, we can kind of design it as we see fit in real time. You know, there's not like a long asset delivery process involved. Um, but still, you know, we had all the assets kind of mapped out, and we needed to design the world. We needed not like a Toronto in a miniverse. Like, you know, we needed to be realistic. We needed to think, how fun can we make this for like a small kind of like basketball experience? Um, how big does it need to be? Like, how much content do we need to place around? Uh, what kind of activities can we give the player? But you know, we should also be concerned about performance. Like, we need to think about performance over visuals. You know, like, again, I like working on visuals, but that isn't the kind of thing that we want people to take away from this. We want people to engage and have fun more than anything. And we also need to think about, you know browser performance and all the limitations we're dealing with from the MBA application, we have no control over that. So there were quite a few restrictions in place, but I think we designed something kind of cool. Um, Unity was a really important part of this process. Uh, we used it to design and iterate on the world like, really quickly. Uh, it takes, obviously, a long time to import stuff into FreeJS and kind of like move things around. but. Having like a level designer using Unity to quickly like move buildings, design a level was really cool, and you know we could kind of just like pull the pull the scenes down, have a look at it ourselves, and kind of like you know give them feedback and stuff. Uh, at one point, they added like a million poly, uh, million polygons with the trees, and I was like, okay, cool, <laughs> you know. Um, I was like, we're not trying to build the Eden Center. We're just trying to make like a nice looking city that has, you know, like enough visual variety within it and stuff. So always kind of, you know, collaborate. Uh, don't take your eyes away too long because, you know, things can easily get out of control. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice process. Uh, but, you know, the cool thing about Unity as well is that it's very easy to uh, experiment with different things, especially lighting. Uh, you can easily add lights. You can easily add post-processing. 
So, you know, adding like color filters, um, trying to get the visual style to match. And then it's very easy to take that and kind of like apply the same settings in WebGL as well. Um, but as I was saying, you know, we had hundreds of assets to load and to um, think about compressing. Uh, in our process, we have a separate GitHub repository. In the end, it got to like over a gig in size. Uh, some projects in the past, we've just included that in our main GitHub repo, so you can imagine how slow that can be. So now we try to uh, separate the assets from the code as much as possible, but we only compress what we need to compress and transfer to the main final repository. So uh, the cool thing about doing it this way is that we're able to compress all the source stuff and uh, using um, KTX and GLTF, uh, we're able to optimize the assets as much as possible. And these tools are free, they're open source, they're made by Kronos Group. Uh, they're really powerful tools to you know, get the best out of your project as well. And one of the nice takeaways is that we generated uh, TypeScript files, which are code files. Uh, they outputted all the different types of assets, so that was like one less thing we had to worry about. Uh, when it came to programming. But yeah, we have these huge 3D worlds. We have the avatars. Like, how do we load this? How do we render this? Um, has anyone played a video game where you just had really bad frame rate status and it's just kind of like, you know, sometimes crashed and stuff? Um, that can be down to like shader compilation on the fly. I'm, I'm not sure if anyone's seen The Last of Us, the video game that was released recently on a PC. They had a lot of shader problems. And this is usually like PC games will compile shaders on the fly, which really impacts someone's um, you know, experience. And there's definitely ways we can you know, um, counter that as well, right? Uh, the benefit of doing things uh, in FreeJS and in WebGL is that you get to learn the kind of techniques behind what the game engines are doing for you. And you know, like this was kind of problem we needed to solve ourselves because it's always based on the scale of the kind of project you're building. Um, when I first loaded the scene, this was like a kind of snapshot of the browser just hanging up, you know? We were trying to uh, render like 240 geometries at once, um, you know, nearly 200 textures, and that's quite a lot of the browser to handle. Um, and this is just the design of FreeJS. FreeJS is like a library built on top of WebGL, which simplifies things for you, but it doesn't handle these types of scenarios, right? This is down to the project you're making. Um, so how I tackled that, um, I basically load the entire world, I split it into chunks, and then I render each chunk over like 100 milliseconds. And then that way you're breaking down the amount of content you have to load and you know, kind of like process, and you're giving the graphics, uh, graphics card time to breathe. And I think you know, that's kind of a nice thing because um, those kind of problems don't exist in you know, Unity or Unreal. It just does that for you. So it's kind of nice to learn those things and feel like you've accomplished something as well. It's kind of cool. But yeah, um, when it comes down to 3D rendering, a lot of the performance as well is down to what you're actually drawing. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's seen these kind of diagrams before, but this is uh, camera fresh from culling. And you know, uh, from the perspective of the user, we only want to draw what's within the user's field of view. We don't care about any of the stuff around, right? And uh, one way we can really optimize this is by using instancing. And instancing allows us to draw multiple copies of the same object um, directly on the graphics card rather than having separate like, um, geometries. But the thing is, like, FreeJS doesn't do this out of the box. Um, it does a lot of things, but this wasn't one of the things that it did. And Again, we, you know, like we spent some time to kind of R&D this, and in the end, we managed to patch the instance class, uh, which really helped with performance and rendering. So that way, you know, we're technically only rendering what the user sees at this point. And having like 1,300 different meshes in the scene, we were able to instance a lot of them. So this really helped with the rendering performance. So yeah, how do we add interactivity? Um, Physics is a very common thing you'll find in video games, uh, but we're not trying to create like a very complex like physics system. We don't need a complex physics system. So I always like to start simple, then add more advanced tools on the fly uh, if needed. But um, I came across this library called FreeMesh BVH. Very cool, very powerful. Uh, and one of the benefits of this is that 
it, A, it had like code examples of how to do player collision and sphere collision, but it gave us extra features out of the box, like accelerated ray casting, and that is something we use a lot in uh, WebGL applications. And what that basically means is that we can fire a ray, and we can traverse through the entire scene and find the exact intersection point very quickly. And this technique is used a lot in ray tracing and video games uh, because you need to kind of do a lot of ray intersection tests. And this library is super cool because it gives you the tools to kind of visualize that, right? I don't like using code where I can't see what's happening, you know, because you're basically just guessing how it works. So having like a really nice toolkit to kind of visualize these things really helps developers as well. And the benefit of this is that, you know, we can use um, this BVH to do player movement. We can do handle ball collisions. And all of the physics is calculated real time, you know, like on a user's device. Uh, we didn't get time to do like web worker physics, but it would have helped more in the end. But honestly, I feel like with all the optimizations we did, it kind of made things, um, you know, suitable enough for this. And yeah, since this world was kind of floating in space, we needed to handle these kind of use cases where people would just run off and jump into infinity. Um, I made this out of bounds system, which is kind of nice. So I'm firing four different rays, and like if they intersect with the ground and uh, they don't with the sky, then I basically save the user's location so that way they can run anywhere. And, but if they get stuck in like a wall or if they fall off the ground, then I just respawn them. And you know this is a very nice kind of way to kind of combat these like edge cases. But yeah, we didn't really get a huge amount of time to like light and um, kind of finesse the world. But luckily enough, you know we we have a ton of lighting built into FreeJS. So we used like global environment map. Uh, we used different type of lightings built in. Uh, we did a really cool kind of like bait shadow system. So. Real-time lighting and shadows in FreeJS um, is quite heavy sometimes. Uh, so we basically render all the shadows into another uh, shadow map, and that basically caches it. So when we apply real-time shadows, it's using a combination of like bait shadowing for all the static stuff that doesn't move, and real-time shadows for the avatar. So that way, we are able to really like you know improve the performance of the shadow stuff. And then we used a real bloom pass for all the neon stuff. And some lovely vignette, which you know is kind of a staple in uh, creative coding experiences. Uh, lastly, gameplay. Uh, gameplay is obviously the most important part, since it's what you're actually doing in this world. Uh, the main kind of point is is to earn PX, which is kind of our take on XP to unlock new gear. Uh, we wanted to um, allow users to contribute to their favorite team's leaderboard and for them to play with up to eight players um, in the two multiplayer game modes. And you know, shooting is probably the biggest like game mechanic. Uh, so this needed to be really fun and you know, like um, kind of rewarding when you make these shots because you know basketball's not easy. I'm sure many of you have tried to score a three point throw. It's not easy to do that. Uh, but what we ended up doing, we used like a cubic Bezier curve free and um, this was kind of uh, our approach in this, kind of like uh, we needed to be very flexible because this also had to be replayed on the server to make sure that shots were validated. So going for this kind of more deterministic approach versus physics kind of made sense. And it also you know, was easier for us to kind of test uh, from a, a game server um, place. Uh, Duncan's really cool. Like everyone wants to kind of show off in that uh, sense. So. Every time you score free, um, free shots, uh, you kind of get this special ability to do a cool slam dunk. And it's really cool to see like, a lot of people all doing this at once and kind of like, flying around the room. You know? um, it adds for a lot of, like, you know, the kind of like, wow factors. Like, um, yeah, it, it just makes it look more of a spectacle as well. Um, I, I guess I'm a bit mischievous when I play video games. I like to annoy other people. <laughs> so I think most of my time testing this was just blocking other people <laughs> as they were trying to score points. So, um, you know, it, it, it adds a level of com um, compet. It adds um, an extra level of, like, competitiveness. And, you know, it just makes it a bit more fun. So, yeah, when you, when you jump near a player, uh, you, can, uh, you can block their attempt, um, which is kind of fun. But yeah, this was me, I think, with Jonathan, and I just kept blocking him. I think he was getting quite annoyed, but <laughs> yeah, it was fun. 
but yeah, we, we managed to launch this on time, um, thank goodness. Uh, there was over 150 people working on this project. It's really a huge accomplishment. Um, MBA and Google were really happy with that. Uh, this, yeah, it was honestly nuts. I never thought we would do it, but we really worked hard together. You know, I think none of this would have been possible if we weren't positive. Um, and you know, I, I think for me, uh, be, being optimistic is probably one of the key takeaways. You know, like trying to motivate your team, keep the morale high. Um, if you feel down, your team can like feel that as well. So trying to stay positive even when things are really tough is not easy, but it's really important for you know the people that are surrounding you. Um, focusing on playability of the visuals is obviously more important. You know, people want a fun experience at the end of the day. Um, you know, we can always improve on things in time to come, but yeah, making sure the core experience is, you know, working properly is kind of the key thing. Um, uh, for me, planning for the future, you know, like I feel this could have gone a bit easier if I kind of like force, foresaw this kind of project going to come. So maybe, um, you know, working on like a microverse, like, platform in the future to help, you know, build more projects like this would be cool. Uh, but yeah, thank you. That was my talk. <laughs> that was amazing. So we actually, we actually don't have time for Q&A, oh. but, but I want to sit down anyways because it looks comfortable. So look, we've got about 15 minutes. There's only two more talks left, okay? So soak it up. 15 minutes. We'll see you back here at 3.55. We're just going to chill. Bye. <laughs> that was great.